and I can hear you fine. Great, thanks. Just a heads up to people that might be getting here um, more recently. We're going to give it till about five minutes after to get going. So um, we're here. We're just kind of waiting for folks to trickle in. Thanks. All the good people are here. Greetings, Jeff. Um, just a uh, heads up, we're gonna wait till about five after to get going, letting uh, folks have a few minutes to uh, get here. How's my favorite long range planner? Doing great, how about yourself? If I was any better, me, if I was any better, I'd be twins, which according to my brother is a scary thought that he says one of me is enough. <laughs> Siblings can do that. All right, it looks like we've got to about five after, so um, might as well at least get going. We have a good proportion of the folks that we had expected to be here based on registration, so it seems like a good enough time to get going. Um, just to uh, get things started, you know, my name is Eric Olson, Long Range Planning Manager with the City of Lake Oswego, joined with um, joined by our consultants with MIG and with um, Johnson Economics tonight, and we'll introduce ourselves here in a moment, but uh, just wanted to obviously point out that we're here today to um, talk about the housing needs analysis and housing production strategy at, here at a neighborhood forum um, hosted by the city. Um, and uh, yeah, I just wanted to, I guess, quickly go over a little bit of the procedure and protocol for this evening. Uh, before we get started, at least. So, and Andrew, if you can go to the next slide. So I'll just begin by going over a bit of the instructions for our, um, for the Zoom meeting tonight. Um, first of all, I just ask folks to be sure to mute themselves um, during the majority of the, the presentation, at least portion tonight. If you do have questions during that presentation, um, please be sure to submit them using the chat function in writing. Um, you can see at the bottom of your screen, if you're not that familiar with Zoom, you can see there's a chat button down there. So just click that and either direct it to myself, um, one of the 
folks with our consultant team or just everyone, that, that's fine as well. Uh, to ask anything, uh, we, we will, I guess, be having question and answer sort of sessions during um, a couple of uh, points and a couple of points during the presentations today. Um, so if you'd like to ask any questions during that period, um, please just raise your hand using the reactions function on the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, if you click on that, you'll notice that one of the first and largest options that you can click on is just to raise your hand. So um, we'd ask that for verbal questions during those question and answer sessions um, that you use that raise hand function. Um, to obviously, um, we want you to have the opportunity to provide even more input um, and more detailed input. So we just want to mention that we have an online open house right now that covers similar information and allows for some detailed written input as well as um, opportunities to answer questions in, in a survey that we've created on that uh, website. So we really encourage you to um, let folks know about that and to fill it out yourselves. And that's um, another great way to provide some input tonight. And, and I'll just note that the, uh, the the online open house, it's it's uh, linkable from, or it's on the, uh, the city's website. So if you just go to City of Lake Oswego's website, find the uh, planning page, um, you can find it there. And we can uh, maybe put that into the chat as well, the actual link that will take you directly to the open house if you'd like. We'll do that in just a moment here, and that will be available until April 21st, just as a reminder to folks here. Um, so that will be uh, out there for another week or two. All right. Um, Andrew, if you want to go back to the agenda slide, I can go over a little bit of what we're going to discuss today. Um, of course, we just went over some of the instructions for the meeting tonight. Um, we're going to then get into introductions, which will be just in a moment here. Um, we'll have a little bit of a discussion or a, a actually a more lengthy discussion rather about housing needs with our uh, consultant, Brendan Buckley from Johnson Economics. Um, after that, we'll have a bit of a Q&A session to talk about that and answer questions. Then Andrew Parrish with MIG, our consultants, um, will talk about the results of our buildable land inventory. And we'll have another Q&A session following that, and then talk about next steps for the project. Okay, well, um, hello everybody. My name is Andrew Parrish with MIG, um, consultant hired by the city of Lake Oswego to um, work on some of this housing um, uh, work for the city. Um, I'm gonna give you a little bit of a background about um, House Bill 2003 and kind of related housing efforts um, for the city. Um, Eric, could you mute yourself? I think I'm hearing some bounce back from you. Thank you. Um, and uh, so I'm just going to go over kind of the big picture of what it is we're trying to accomplish with this project. And then I'm going to hand it over to Brendan Buckley, who's going to talk about um, the housing needs portion of it. So um, briefly, House Bill 2003 was passed in 2019. Um, its purpose is to make sure that communities across the states, including um, communities in the metro area, um, plan to meet the diverse housing needs of all Oregonians. And so cities over the um, size of 10,000 in population, um, as well as cities in the metro area are required to uh, analyze what their housing need is for their current um, population and for future rev uh, residents. We usually use about a 20 year time horizon to be thinking out um, into the future and to keep doing that analysis every six to eight years. So it's not a one and done kind of thing. It's a, uh, you do the analysis, you see how you're doing, you do another one in six to eight years and, and ideally it uh, continues into the future. Um, there's also an element called the housing production strategy that's required within a year of completing that analysis. So the analysis, which is where we are in this process is um, kind of at a 30,000 foot level um, the housing production strategy gets into more detail and says, okay, what are the actual actions that the city's going to undertake? And um, what, you know, what order do they need to happen in? Who are the partners that we need to work with? Um, so that's the, the more granular level that will um, follow after this process. Um, so for the housing needs analysis, there's there's basically two sides of the equation. There's the demand side and there's the supply side. 
Um, so the housing needs projection is um, what Brendan Buckley from Johnson Economics is going to speak to. Um, it addresses the um, characteristics of the current and uh, expected future population of the city of Lake Oswego, what housing needs um, that population has. And then there's the supply side, um, which is the buildable lands inventory, what land is available to accommodate housing units for that population, both existing and future. Um, those are reconciled in, in a document or um, maybe a chapter of a document called the uh, residential land needs analysis. And then out of, out of that comes kind of policy questions and strategy questions for what should the city do um, you know, given this need and this supply. And uh, and so this is kind of a, a general um, sense of the approach that, that we're taking to this project. Um, just to real quickly to touch on the timeline of um, this process, we started in um, kind of fall of last year. Um, we've done work with um, the city and with the city's um, housing Task Force, which is a body that meets pretty regularly to review our draft materials and guide the project. <clears throat> um, so we are uh, currently in the. I don't know if you can see my mouse very well, but um, you know we're we're in uh, early April here, so we've completed drafts of the housing needs analysis and the, the buildable lands inventory. Um, there's still some things in flux, but they're they're coming together. Um, we wanted to go out to the public and um, see if things uh, seem to make sense to you all. Um, we're going to also be speaking with the city's planning commission and city council um, on these similar topics. Um, through the rest of this year, we're going to be finalizing this analysis and uh, getting into the topic of kind of strategies to um, address the needs uh, in various, you know, income categories uh, and uh, housing type categories that we've seen. Um, and uh, produce a report of uh, recommended housing strategies uh, early next year, um, hopefully for uh, a, another round of community engagement um, in 2024, and then uh, and then adoption by um, city council and uh, or planning commission and city council. Um, so with that, I'm going to hand it over to Brandon Buckley to talk a bit about what uh, goes into the analysis of housing needs. And uh, after that, we will pause and uh, have some discussion about this topic. Thanks, Andrew. Um, so uh, as Andrew just mentioned, the this part, housing needs analysis is sort of um, it's a technical analysis trying to get to housing demand side of the 20 years uh, study period that we're looking at. So um, we're undergoing an analysis to come up with an estimate of the amount and types of housing that will be needed over that 20 year period based on uh, forecasts of population growth and uh, assumptions about uh, the demographic makeup of that group over time. Um, so the methodology for the housing needs analysis is um, looks at both the, your current housing and current demographic uh, profile to see how your current housing uh, needs are being met and, and how well they match up with your current housing inventory. And then we're looking uh, forward again for a 20-year period um, until the year 2043 in this case. Um, the... Uh, the way that these studies are done now, there are rules that are applied that come from the state on how cities are to do these studies. And cities in the metro region are um, work with metro to come up with uh, what's called a coordinated uh, population forecast for all the cities in the metro region. Uh, this was done a couple years ago. Um, it's probably uh, the next cycle of doing it again with Metro is coming up here. But um, long story short, the rules say that we need to look to this forecast that um, the city worked on with Metro back in 2018. And that's the forecast that we need to use um, to say what the population will be and the number of households will be in the year 2043. So that sort of in number 
is um, given to us from that Metro forecast. And we're working to uh, try to determine what the makeup of that housing might be, uh, what the what the changes might be. So uh, within that forecast. Uh, and ultimately we want to identify that housing by tenure. Tenure is the uh, sort of technical term for whether people rent or own. Uh, and then we want to come up with estimates of um, pricing and rent levels that might be affordable to future households and unit type in terms of uh, family units, apartment units, townhomes, and and next slide, please. So population growth in uh, Lake Oswego. Uh, this is a summary of what's been happening there. Um, this shows the from the year uh, 2000 to 2023. And then again, that forecast um, that we have in our analysis thus far um, to 2043. So the uh, population in Lake Oswego has experienced fairly modest growth. Part of that has to do with um, the uh, land constraints and um, uh, limitations on uh, new land to build housing on. So growth has been positive, certainly, but um, um, fairly slow over the last 20 years. And going forward, looking at that um, metro forecast, they forecast the, the future growth to be really very modest. So the uh, entire growth over 20 years, they predict to only be a little over 400 people in your total population. Um, which is well under 1% uh, growth per, uh, well, I'm sorry, no, it's 1% growth total, well under 1% growth uh, per year, um, which is closer to how fast the state uh, grows uh, statewide. So, you know, it's fairly slow growth remaining in this uh, forecast. Number of households is projected to grow more quickly. So you see it growing. Um, currently, your estimated number of households is about 17,500, give or take. That's estimated to grow to uh, 19,300, give or take. So growth of 1,800 um, new households or 10% growth. And the reason that household growth is projected to um, so greatly exceed the population growth rate is because um, the uh, average size of households in Lake Oswego is projected to continue its decline, um, which um, households are getting smaller nationwide. It's a long-term trend. But what that means is as the as average households get smaller, you need more households to hold the same amount of population as it would be uh, smaller. So that's why that growth rate is faster. Housing units, um, so the growth projected growth in housing units is um, approaching 2,000 new units needed over the 20 year period. Um, that is closely tied to the number of households projected, but also there's a factor included in there for um, some vacancy of units in any healthy market either for um, you know, uh, the for sale housing market or the uh, rental apartment market, both have some vacancy in, in there in a healthy market so that people find units and move around um, uh, without that vacancy. We assume a stable vacancy rate of 5%. In the slide. The incomes in Lake Oswego are um, high. It's a high income. A community, which uh, uh, may not be surprising, the median household income by 2023 um, is approaching $125,000 uh, per household. Um, the statewide median is closer to 70000 so you see that it's um, a quite a bit higher. And um, per capita income, similarly, it's approaching 75000 So. Um, the average incomes in Lake Oswego remain quite a bit higher than either the county or the state and um, have grown quite a bit uh, in excess of inflation over that same period. So not only is it um, remaining a, a higher income community, but, um, but it's uh, growing as well. The, the uh, household continue to prosper. So I've 
muting trends. This is a reflection of sort of who uh, the workforce is in Lake Oswego. This is an important thing to think about when you're thinking about housing, who's working in the community, who um, can afford to live there. Might there be some um, local employees who would like to live there, but perhaps um, can't uh, afford the housing that's available. So um, what we find is that in Lake Oswego, it's an estimated about 2,250 residents who both live and work in Lake Oswego. But you see in the orange arrow on the right, that is the workforce that lives elsewhere that is coming into work in Lake Oswego. Uh, the blue arrow on, uh, I'm sorry, the blue arrow on the right is the uh, folks who live in Lake Oswego but go elsewhere uh, for their primary job. So um, you see from the percentages below that um, roughly 10 to 12% are both working and living there. Uh, and then the rest of the workforce is either coming and going. This trend is not um, that unusual in the metro area. We're obviously a connection, a collection of, of um, tightly connected cities with a lot of overlap. So um, this isn't necessarily um, that unusual, but it's something to think about. Uh, the, there's a jobs per housing ratio of 1.3 jobs available in the community estimated um, per household. And right now, just about one, uh, the average for a Lake Oswego household is just about one worker per household. Um, there are actually uh, slightly more jobs in the community than um, than the residents themselves. Next slide. Um, current housing conditions. Uh, there's a lot on this slide, uh, so I'll, I'll just give a brief summary. Um, so in terms of tenure, the community is about 71% uh, owner-occupied housing units and 29% renters. The... Um, the average statewide is a little bit less than 65% home ownership rate. So you have a slightly higher ownership rate there. Um, most uh, uh, ownership units are three or more bedrooms. They're gonna be larger on average in square footage. And most rental units have two or fewer bedrooms um, and are gonna be uh, lower in square footage. Again, that's a fairly common um, trend. And then on the right there, uh, you see in uh, green and orange that uh, a breakdown of the uh, housing units, occupied housing units in the community by whether they're own, uh, owned or, or rented and the types of housing those are. So 81% um, of owner occupied units are single family detached homes, um, but there's a mixture in there of other types of home, uh, attached homes, including uh, 10% are townhomes and then a mixture of other types. And most um, most rental units are in uh, a car apartment complexes of five or more units, the larger apartment complexes, about 60%. But then there's also a mixture in there and um, also some single detached homes that are also for rent. But This is the age of your housing stock. As you can see, most of your, uh, sort of the greatest share of your housing stock was built in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, um, and a diminishing share um, either before that or, or after that. So um, that's gonna be the age of a lot of both your your ownership and your, your rental stock, but still, um, you know, approaching 10% of your current housing stock was built uh, in the early 2000s and another 10% uh, since 2010. So you do continue to add and build on your, on your stock. Right. And this is a breakdown of our 20-year um, forecast. Um, we're in the part of the process where we're talking to groups like you, we're talking to the advisory group for this project. And so um, everything is still in sort of draft form. Um, so this it gives a hint of what our, our findings were. They may be changing a bit, uh, particularly in the types of housing that we're forecasting uh, based on feedback we receive and ongoing discussion. But 
Uh, basically, you see the total number of units needed is what I mentioned on the earlier slide. It's approaching uh, 2,000 new units needed over the next 20 years, uh, 1,968 units to be specific, and that's 11% growth in the inventory. And then on the right, you see sort of how we are breaking down assumptions of what unit types those might be. And so we take as a starting point the um, most uh, sort of the, the types of units permitted over the last 10, 20 years, what has been built most recently, what does new housing stock, the, the newest housing stock look like in the community. And then we're adding assumptions, um, specifically a, a big assumption has to do with middle housing uh, and the new middle rules for middle housing that are coming from the state that require uh, that certain types of plexes be allowed to be built in uh, uh, neighborhoods with single family zoning. And so there is an uh, estimated increase in those types of uh, units needed in this forecast. And the other thing, um, that is needed is to rebalance a little bit the current inventory between renters and owners. So there's a slight deficit that we're finding in the current inventory of, of rental units. So uh, for 20 years from now, we need to make up that deficit and um, supply new renter houses. And so what you see here is that this, um, this forecast of needed units over 20 years is a little more skewed toward rental households. And so you're going to see higher need also for those apartment units and uh, properties of five or more units. Next slide. Uh, this is uh, the same numbers, but broken down by um, our estimate of, of the um, need by income segment for those future households. So what you see on the left are categories of of um, income ranging from uh, extremely low income to upper income. These are categories um, that are based on the percentage uh, uh, that that household makes of the area median income. These are categories that are used in a lot of affordable housing programs. They're used by HUD and so on. And that's where these sort of, sort of break down come from in these kind of terminology. Um, so it's applied to the local incomes um, that's in the third column there when the, we have estimated income ranges. Um, so that is applied to um, the uh, that's applied to the factor that the state uses to determine eligibility for a lot of affordable housing program. They use an income estimate from the county. Um, so that's where that's coming from, and you see a breakdown there of where we think a lot of that. Uh, the distribution of need for those units will be, you still see uh, close to 50% to sort of at the upper middle to upper income range, but you see a lot of need also at lower income ranges. And the uh, breakdown on the right of the types of units that typically, not always, but typically serve uh, people in those, those income ranges to give you some idea of what those unit types are. Uh, next slide. This is my final slide. So this is just a, another point to make about, um, about that sort of breakdown, especially by income group, um, is that housing development is typically done by, um, most housing development is done by private for-profit companies, home builders and developers who are building, um, you know, market rate products. Then there's another type of housing that's built by nonprofit agencies, often um, building uh, what might be called subsidized affordable housing. So um, going forward, as we get into the next step that Andrew mentioned, which is the housing production strategy and coming up with strategies of what, what all this means, we try to keep in mind that the private real estate market, uh, home building market, already meets some of these categories. And so oftentimes what we need to focus on is those categories, some of those price points and types of housing that um, are not being um, sort of naturally organically uh, supplied by the 
So I think that that's what I have. I know I've seen a lot of chat going on. I haven't read read it yet, but I'll um have a look to see if folks have questions for me. Yeah, Brendan, I uh, captured some of those. Um, I can just uh, start with the first one, and we can work our way down if that if that works for you. Sure. All right. So the first one was from Bill Jarsh, um, and his question was. What are the factors for such a historically low population growth between 2023 and 2043? Right. Um, that is a question that we get a lot. Um, again, that is coming from, there's a difficulty because what's happened, what happens is the, the final number for 2043 is coming from Metro. Um, Again, every few years they work with all the cities in the metro area to kind of allocate, allocate what they think the um, overall growth is going to be. And they kind of right around allocate it to different communities. Um, and I can say from working with other cities in the metro area, no one is very convinced about how realistic these forecasts are. Uh, in this latest round, um, but they they are what they are. Um, and the trick is that while our number for 40, 2043 is given to us and stays stable, the population in 2000, 2001, 2002, and so on has continued to change. And so um, the number for 2023 has risen more than Metro assumed. It's already risen. We've already seen more growth presses that even more so um tricky it's uh but that's that's kind of where we're at and um it's going to continue i can tell you that will continue to be a topic of discussion in the advisory committee and so on it's not resolved yet but unfortunately it gets back to what's required yeah and i would just um kind of add to that that um, it's likely that the way we calculate our forecasts will change. And so just kind of a reminder that we're actually required by the state to update these every six years, likely um, the next time as a city we do a uh, update to our housing needs analysis will be kind of within the merging Oregon housing needs analysis framework, which kind of uses a different kind of structure to determine that, that sort of forecast. So um, the sort of, uh, Parameters are changing a bit, um, so that's just something to keep in mind that this is not only something that we're going to be, you know, we'll be revising these documents based on the input that we get from you tonight, but just moving forward, um, this is something the state has put down, you know, a requirement that um, cities update every six years, so this is something we'll be revisiting on a fairly regular schedule, um, at least compared to the last time we did this um, in 2013. And I'll move on to the next question, if that is, um, and you know, if that answers your question, I guess, Bill. Um, yes. yes, it does. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks for the question. Uh, the next question is from Kate Myers. Um, question is, do people who work from home now or have hybrid home office work count in this number of 2,250 that live and work in Lake Oswego? Um, the answer is that I don't, we don't believe, um, the best that we can assess uh, that this data, which comes from uh, is catching the uh, increase in work from home very well. So the answer is not that satisfying. Um, we think probably a lot of those jobs are showing up as residents who live in Lake Oswego and have a job outside of the city because technically the company that they're working for remotely is uh, headquartered or located outside of the city. So um, that's tricky. And that is something that the um, census is going to have to probably refine their methodology. And, um, Do you mind if I speak on that? Are, are you okay yeah. if I join in the conversation? Okay. Um, so I think this is really kind of a critical issue that's going to impact us as a city and in my neighborhood in particular, I'm in Lake Forest, 
uh, in the coming years because of the proposed tolling of 205. So as much as we can shrug our shoulders and say, hey, we don't really know because a lot's changed recently, like that quite candidly just may not be a good enough answer as to how that's gonna impact our roadways and commutes and maintenance and all of that type of thing for planning. Um, already there's a lot of concern that people are gonna be trying to cut the corner from I-5 through Lake Oswego down to 205 off of Stafford. Um, so just please, if there's any way to get better numbers for actual office occupancy, even just from Shorenstein, I mean, that's like probably one of our biggest contributors to inbound commuters. And I think they have a huge amount of vacancy, you know, I, I don't know how else you could do it for other, other aspects, but I, I think it would be worth pursuing. Okay. Thank you. I think those are, are good points. Um, so yes, I, I guess um, what I'll say is I, I will keep digging on that one. Um, someone in the advisory committee asked about that as well. So um, as we uh, do the next draft, I'll, I'll dig deeper into that and see, see what I can find. Um, work from home question. Thanks, Brendan. Um, just moving on to the next question. Um, it was answered in the chat, um, but Wendy Trapp uh, asked, can you know what you mean by middle housing, 60 to 120% AMI? Um, is that what we mean? Um, and Matt Hasty, who's also um, on our consultant team here from MIG um, here uh, in the audience and uh, answering questions with us, um, gave a response that is um, hopefully answers that question, but I'll just summarize it. Um, Matt mentioned that AMI refers to area median income. So basically 60 to 120% AMI, you know, would mean that um, we're talking about households making between 60 to 120% of that median income. Um, so essentially lower income through moderate income households relative to the average incomes in the area is what we're talking about there. Um, when it comes to, when we're talking about the term middle housing though, that really refers to a type of housing um, so it's, um, you know, talking about duplexes, triplexes, quadplexes, townhomes, and cottage cluster housing, as opposed to the incomes of the folks that live in a particular area uh, compared to the, you know, I guess compared to that AMI um, in, in the larger area. That, yeah, that's correct. So um, the, the AMI is about middle income, and then middle housing is referring to something else, which is a, uh, those Um, <laughs> we used to only have the middle income uh, term and now they've dropped middle housing on us. So I uh, maybe we'll look at how to refine that and clarify that as well. But the um, important to point out that they are not the same and that folks at middle income, the, the what's called middle housing is not necessarily intended for the folks at middle income. They're not uh, they're not related. Okay. All right. So the next question from Wendy is: Do you know how? Uh, do you have an average of how many units are currently being developed per year in Lake Oswego? And I think we had that on one of those slides. Um, I don't know if that was on one of the slides in particular. Um. Well, I'll, uh, I'll look into that really quick so we can choose the average. Or the... cost per... yeah. I'll Sorry, I'm trying to specific to... question. And do we have the data um, in a table that's easily accessible, uh, Brendan, about the percentage of renters that are currently cost burdened or like you know, below, I think uh, Wendy had referred to that as below 30% AMI, but I think we would probably define it a, a bit differently. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, I do have that in the report. So let me, um, let me look that up and uh, I will need just a minute and then I can report. Um, I believe for permits, we are looking at an average uh, in recent years, 
an average of about maybe 50 to 60 uh, permits per year. Um, there's a lot of variation in that. Um, some uh, some years, if you have a apartment complex being built, you know, it can be hundreds of hundred units and, and so on and so forth. So, um, that's the answer to the permit question and the answer to the other question. Why don't we, why, while I look that up, why don't we, why don't we move on to some of the other questions while I look that up here and maybe we can uh, multitask. Um, Sounds good. Um, all right, so uh, another question from Bill here. Um, is there a metric that shows the current needs based on existing resident income and medium home, median home price? Um, yes, it can be done. It's done in a similar way to the one that I showed for the new units needed. Um, remind me, Eric, if the if our drafts are posted right now on the... Yes. Okay. Yes, they've been posted for a few weeks now. Yeah, so I guess maybe that's what I should say first, is that um, there is a, a very uh, kind of much more lengthy and detailed report um, with a bunch of other data sets in it um, available on the website, um, more than I could can summarize um, in a meeting like this. So a lot of these things are available and they're in that report. Um, so I would, uh, I would just, uh, point you in that direction, um, to answer some of these things that I don't know the answer off. Of. Um, if 80% of existing units are single family homes and we have an affordability crisis, why are we predicting the majority of new units will also be single family homes? Um, these, those are important questions. Um, the, uh, types of future units needed and how to, to meet the needs of all households. Um, the point of this type of study is sort of um, to update a city's comp plan. Um, you, you really are required to look at the needs of everyone in the community at all income levels. Um, as I alluded to kind of on the last slide, when it gets to actual strategies and implementation actions, most communities end up being more worried about the lower income households because they're the hardest to serve. But the, um, the forecast itself does need to include all households. So it, um, so generally our forecast will include uh, in, in most communities that yes, single family homes are still a predominant, um, the predominant form of housing for homeowners and, um, you know, realistically that will continue in, in the future. Um, so that it's tough for folks who wanna meet uh, the, the needs of others. Uh, sometimes it, it seems more important to focus on others and really not, um, the single family homes. Um, Kate, do you have a question? Um, more some, different commentary of different topics to talk about. So if if you're not done with this, I can wait. Uh, well, let's see. I think I've tried to hit most of the questions in the chat. So um, I guess why don't you go ahead, please? OK, so I, I read the majority of the supplemental report that was posted. It had a lot more graphs and tables and things. So I got through most of it. Um, a couple just observations are, um, one, some of our neighborhoods are part county and part city in terms of jurisdiction and, and ownership. And yet um, the language used in the report frequently said city of Lake Oswego, but the maps would include everything. So can you clarify kind of what was included when you were crunching numbers? Was, was your data set based strictly on those that are listed as city lots or was it a geographic based thing? And then, and then I have some other things after that. 
Um, so quickly on on for my piece, looking at the demand side and these um, sort of facts and figures I've been talking about, that should be for the city itself within the city boundary. Um, Andrew will talk about how we looked at that on the uh, supply side, land supply side, um, but on, on the demand side, yes, that should be for the city and not uh, not any county land or land that's sort of outside the city, but in the urban growth boundary, um, uh, are, those should not be uh, included. Okay, Eric, did you want to respond related to the supply side before I go on? Yeah, I, I, you know, Andrew, please, you know, feel free to chime in if you'd like. But yeah, essentially, we did look at the entirety of, you know, the uh, urban growth boundary for the housing, um, you know, the buildable lands inventory. So we looked at the potential for some land that's currently within an incorporated area to be annexed within the city over the course of the next 20 years. Um, that is something that obviously we see in certain neighborhoods more than others. Um, but that was a factor that we looked at in terms of the city's potential to meet some of those needs. And so, yeah, we'll talk a little bit more about the supply side in the next portion of the presentation. Um, you know, I, I just wanted to briefly say a few things just to give us a little bit of grounding because um, I, I have not mentioned them and I apologize. Um, so <clears throat> the one thing I would mention is that we're hoping to um, have this presentation go about an hour and a half to two hours. So. This is about a, a halfway point. Um, so I just wanted to mention that um, that was the sort of thought for the, the sort of length of this presentation. I'd also mention that we will have this available on the city's um, YouTube page in, in the coming days here. So um, we'll be able to view this in the future. Just wanted to point out things that we should have mentioned a while back. Uh, um, and um, yeah, and then Kate, just uh, getting back to your question, I hope, I hope they answered at least the first part of it. I, I yeah, think I'll we, just... I did realize there was more so i'll wait till i hear the rest of your presentation to ask any further questions yeah maybe just a preview of that i mean um some of the data comes in as like what's inside the city of like the suigo as far as the actual city boundaries um, but if we're looking at kind of the area that the city has some kind of purview over some kind of like long-range planning something over um, we're looking at areas that are outside of the city limits all the way to the urban growth boundary and in terms of like the inventory side of things and so i'll get into that a little bit further but um maybe that answers your question or raises more um but we'll, let's just cover the last couple of uh, ones we see here in the chat um so i would just look up the uh, answer to uh, one of the questions, which is, do we know how many renters are rent burdened, um, uh, paying over 30% of their income towards rent? Um, yes. So roughly 50% of the community's renter households do are cost burdened or considered cost burdened. Um, so 29% of renter households are estimated to be severely cost burdened spending at least 50 percent of the their income on rent so um that's a you know that's that's fairly serious uh, cost burden on on local renters um carolyn asked for the 20-year forecast can we get a breakdown of renters and owners i would refer you again to the draft report um andrew posted a link to that in the chat and again Bob um, so I, I think I'll point you there to, to start digging around and, and you'll find some of those answers in there. Uh, okay. I think those are the questions that I can answer offhand here in the chat. Um, yeah, We've got one more from Carolyn here. Are we okay? So I unmuted myself. I wanted to oh, sorry. my question. You showed a slide that had 677 five unit plus units um, under the new housing today. And so I was wondering, has this been assessed for the rent versus own equation? Are you assuming 
a certain amount of the 677 are going to be owned or how much are going to be rented because when we look at the current supply in that category, it's predominantly rent it, rental. So are we going to uh, are we going to try to see if we can get some of those uh, lower income um, people in ownership, perhaps with units in condominiums, perhaps? Yes. So in the forecast thus far, uh, about one hundred of those um, were forecast to be ownership units. So basically condominiums, and the remainder was for. But that's not necessarily saying that uh, their low income ownership model, it's it's just kind of a split of ownership versus rental. Yeah, and in terms of the sort of um, question or I guess observation that you made about um, ownership opportunities at the lower income spectrum um, or those types of housing units, that is something that we could target um, for our housing production strategies. You know, currently the, the city um, doesn't really have any incentives really for, um, you know, we don't have any specific programs for that. So that could be something that we look into, um, but it's not something that's necessarily captured at least in this portion of the analysis. Okay. Um, for the sake of time, maybe I should uh, move us along towards the um, buildable land inventory portion of things here. Um, thanks for all your good comments so far. And again, um, this will be, this is being recorded and it'll be available on the city's website. Um, and uh, the documents that I, I posted in the, the chat here, they have a lot more detail about the topics that we're talking about. Um, so I'm going to touch briefly on the um, kind of the map side, the land supply side of what it is that uh, we're trying to assess here. And that's how much um, how much land can reasonably be expected to produce new residential units in the future in the city of Lake Oswego. Um, there are a few steps to um, putting this together. Um, we We look at what is considered residential land. Um, we look at what the constraints to developments are. Those are things like steep slopes or wetlands or the lake, um, you know, things that you can't build on. Um, then we, uh, we, we look at which parcels are currently developed, which ones are vacant and which ones are maybe somewhere in between. And then we uh, make some assumptions about what the like zoning um, uh, would allow to be built there and um, what capacity kind of comes from that, from all of that. Um, so this is a map showing the study area in its entirety. So the yellow area here is what's inside the city limits currently. And we are looking at land outside of the city limits um, land that has a city of Lake Oswego comprehensive plan designation um, is basically how we define this boundary. Um, then we look at the, uh, the those comprehensive plan designations to make a, a, a determination of whether it's residential land or not. Um, so this is uh, just, just a map of the, the city's comprehensive plan designation. So you'll see things like R10, R7.5. There's there's a lot of different designations that the city has for um, different kinds of residential land. There's some designations that are strictly industrial or strictly commercial. So we take those out. Um, and there are some that are kind of mixed use, like um, maybe small scale commercial designations, mixed use designations that might have some portion of their, um, some portion of the land show up as uh, residential units in the future. Um, and so this is what that map looks like when we um, put it all together. Basically, the, the yellow area is residential land. The purple area is mixed use. So some amount of that is expected to turn into residential units. And the, the gray and the blue colors are uh, discounted, basically not, not considered for future residential use. Um, after, you know, at the end of this process, it it 
might be appropriate for the city to consider changing some of these zoning designations. Um, that might be something that's on the table um, if there's a deficiency in, in one area or another, um, but this is kind of what, the starting point of what we're doing. Um, so the second step is to look at uh, constraints. Uh, we look at steep slopes, we look at the floodplains, um, the city has a, a system of habitat benefit areas and um, resource conservation areas and resource protection areas. So we have some different assumptions about how much um, land is really developable in all of these colors that you see on the map. Um, you know, generally, it's it, it's safe to assume that less development is expected on steep areas and um, in areas with the uh, some of these resource um, constraints. So um, those are discounted. And then we look at uh, what's called development status. So if, if a lot is uh, has less than $20,000 in improvement value, we use um, uh, tax assessor data to determine this, then we say this is probably a vacant lot. This is a, a location for a new residential unit. Um, if uh, a lot is kind of a very large lot that has a home, um, but maybe has a lot of acreage uh, and can be reasonably expected to provide more housing, um, we call that partially vacant and then other lots we call developed. And so of course that partially vacant category is the interesting one. Where do you draw that line? Um, there's a lot more detail in the uh, in the report, but generally we use the um, the city zoning designations to determine, um, you know, if 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 a lot is five times bigger than what you would be allowed to kind of build a new single family home on, then we'll say there's there's some there's a likelihood that that's going to develop over the next twenty years into more housing units, and we've seen that happen. Um, in a number of places in the city. Um, so, uh, it, and there's and there, there's some more detail in the report there, but that's basically how we're um, using that to make the determination. And I think the map here shows um, the uh, our our initial assessment of what's developed, what's partially vacant, and what's vacant. So for all of these partially vacant properties, we're assuming about a quarter acre for the existing home, and then the remaining acreage um, turns into some kind of, uh, uh, it turns into to new development consistent with the zoning um, on the site there. Um, and if it's an area that's outside the city limits, then we use the comprehensive plan designation, which is pretty similar to the zoning. Um, and you'll see the, the constraints kind of layered on top here to show that those are Discounted. So, um, so, so I do a lot of these reports for a lot of different jurisdictions, and I'll say um, the amount of vacant land in the city is pretty um, slim. There isn't a lot of vacant land in the city, and they are kind of select lots here and there, scattered throughout. Um, partially vacant land. There's some larger lots that seem like they're pretty likely to subdivide. And there are some larger lots that may be less likely to subdivide. So um, it's the, the, you know, the, the policy question that comes from this is going to be, how much do we expect this to really happen? And, you know, what do we, what do we do about that assumption? Um, so after we have that designation of, of all the lots in the city, we take some set-asides for new streets and new infrastructure, um, larger kind of vacant properties. We assume that there's going to be a new right-of-way that comes through so that um, eats into the developable space. Partially vacant lots, um, probably not a new road going through there, so uh, we don't assume new set-asides there. And then we, um, we have basically a table of uh, assumed densities for each zoning designation. Um, and so what all this comes out to um, is this uh, sort of messy table, but um, on all of the, the basically raw land that we're seeing in the city, um, we're talking about about 1,400 units uh, as uh, developable capacity on about 360 acres. Um, there are some other kind of categories of things that aren't really, um, that are, are on top of that number. So there's uh, the number of units that are approved in the Merrill Hurst University um, uh, 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 plan. So that's about 70 more units that are approved. 
Um, we've also made an assumption for new middle housing capacity um, based on the city's new regulations. So this is um, a, for example, an existing single family home that subdivides internally or adds a new unit out back or that kind of thing. Um, the state has a number that's about 3% that cities can use and to say, uh, you know, this is this is a safe harbor kind of assumption here. So that, that comes to about 400 units over the next 20 years of um, middle housing sort of subdivisions. Um, and then there's the question of, um, you know, how much redevelopment is the city really going to see on land that's mixed use or has a multifamily designation? You know, maybe there's some lots that have a um, a single family home on them currently, but it's zoned for something more. Is that going to redevelop um, if it doesn't meet the the definitions of, you know, partially vacant from from previously? So that's kind of a next step for us. Um, but we're looking at about 1,876, so, so about 1,900 units overall of capacity based on these current assumptions. Um, and so that uh, that brings us to another sort of Q&A section, and I'm seeing a lot of cues showing up on the left side of my screen here. So I can try to answer some of them. Um, the first question I see is, uh, could infrastructure costs be used to as a constraint? Um, I, th I think yes. Uh, that's something that we usually look to the city to help us identify. So if there are if there are areas where infrastructure is like has been has been a problem and it's documented that it's a problem, then we can adjust our assumptions for how you know how dense development is um, in that area. Uh, how how dense development is likely to be in that area, but it's sort of a question of. Um, so Andrew, well, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> I'm going to add to that because I was very recently reading the state statutes that that talk about that, um, and the state statutes basically say that that can be considered if there is a, a determination that areas cannot be served by public infrastructure. So you can't just say, well, it's gonna be expensive to serve those areas. You actually have to have a finding or a determination that it's, it's not possible. It's not, and it could be because of cost, but it can't be just that that's a factor. You really have to show that it's it's not possible. It cannot be done. So I think it's a sort of not necessarily, but possibly depending on how significant the cost is and whether that equates to you really can't do it. So that's kind of that's what the state says about that. Um, and that would require, again, kind of a determination on the city's part that it's it's just not possible, not just it's it's expensive. Carolyn, did you have a follow up to that? Uh, yes, I was thinking about where you have um, partially vacant land in areas that are outside of the city where sewer extension is, is a long known challenge to the city of Lake Oswego. Um, and that I think that if you're gonna consider other kinds of constraints, steeply sloped lots, you know, this kind of thing that I'd like the city to consider those costs of in infrastructure extensions when they're thinking about the potential for um, partially vacant lands or vacant lands that are outside the city's limits. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, good, good point. And I'll follow up with, uh, with the city on, you know, how many lots or how many, what capacity are we really looking at out there? And what might that mean for city infrastructure and, and so on? So yeah, that's a, that's a great point. Now, there's certainly an opportunity where we can use that as a factor in the development rate that we might expect in those unincorporated areas when we look at, at um, the revision here. Um, a question from Bill, can the changes to the max floor space on partially vacant lot increase the number of units? Um, new single family homes uh, are larger than old ones, I, th I think is what I'm seeing there. Um, I, I think our expectation is that partially vacant land, um, you know, d develops at kind of the the mark like the high end of the market for whatever zone that it's in. I think that's a a pretty reasonable expectation. Um, I'm thinking of 
a home with um, a, a, a couple of acres that is suitable for getting a couple of buildings on it and maybe doing sort of a flag lot situation, which is something that we've seen a lot in, in Lake Oswego. So um, the, yeah, well, Bill, it looks like you want to clarify or, or add to that. Oh yeah, no, thank you for letting, letting me speak. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> my thought is, I mean, um, Eric probably knows this too. Um, we'll see a lot that that could, well, maybe in the far future have, you know, more homes or smaller homes and, and they're, they're, they're getting much, much bigger. Um, there's a house near me now that's going from 3,000 to 10,000 floor space, and it could have gone to 16,000 on the lot. So, you know, uh, originally the lot was about two acres. I thought, you know, there might be multiple homes on that, but with the size of those homes, it's real hard to get more units in. Um, and just there's other factors, mostly aesthetic and environmental for that question. So is it reasonable to, to start working on that where the footprints are smaller in the future? You, if things change, you'll have more space and you won't have to deconstruct homes to, to get it in. So but that's my only comment. And it's kind of a question, I guess, too. I don't Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, Bill. Um, I guess I just mentioned from the city's point of view, you know, there are ways to, you know, that we could try to, again, incentivize this type of outcome where there's more density um, or smaller units rather build um, in the future on certain lots, either, um, you know, there, there's a variety of different zoning techniques that we could take to accomplish that um, incentive sort of structures. So. That's something that we can certainly look into. And I know that that's something where, you know, some jurisdictions have been exploring, you know, allowing, um, you know, sort of a scale of floor area where, um, you know, basically a single family would have less cumulative floor area available than something like a quadplex. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, that's something that we can look into. Um, and I know that there's a lot of different approaches that people are taking. Yeah, and that kind of previews the, sort of policy discussion that will come from all of this, you know, if if this partially vacant land is a substantial part of the city's future capacity, you know, what what are the strategies the city can use to maximize that or make the you know the best use of that land? And it does does floor area for certain types of housing factor into that? Um, those are all great kind of points and questions. Um, looks like Kate, Kate. yeah, thanks. Um, so this kind of brings me back to the second half of what I was going to bring up before. Um, when you look at the yellow areas in figure six, um, you know, a lot of those yellow areas are the unincorporated areas. I mean, that that's not marked on that map. But if you overlaid it with figure one, that's what you would see. And we already discussed that the economic and um, demographic information of those unincorporated households, which are substantial, are not at all reflected in the analysis of the first part. So <laughs> I think what we might be setting up here is a thing where the very areas or some of the very areas that are being targeted for you know, the focal point of the housing strategy are, are totally unrepresented <laughs> in, in the information that you have available for the decision makers. Because like in my neighborhood, like my demographic is not Westridge or Hallinan or Birds Hill. And so a piece of that is a concern because since we're, we tend to be a lower total income compared to some of the other neighborhoods, how much of this is gonna fall on us or on Rosewood? How much of Birds Hill, which is yellow at the top is not developable because of the slope? How much of the Hallinan area or um, Glen Morey down there on the lower 
lower right hand side is going to lawyer up and get frustrated and not want to move forward. Each neighborhood has its own piece. And what I have seen happen in the past and what I am concerned about having happen in the future is that we start creating housing policies or strategic plans for the city. And all of these kind of goals are going to start mostly impacting my area without representation. Um, the other piece of this is I would do two things to additionally challenge thinking. One, as you talk about things, please be specific in your language on the second part. Yeah, you, know, you said the city when you were referring to this, and this isn't the city. Like that is some city and some county. So I would just encourage you guys to be very specific in your language of what is city and what is UGB because it's two different pieces that have to be clear in the discussion. And that's important. And then the second thing is, is, you know, what I don't see is anybody saying, okay, well, you know, if these lots are underutilized, as we were saying, a 10,000 square foot house or a six or 5,000 square foot house, maybe that needs to be considered underdeveloped. And that should be considered eligible for for multi-unit subdivision in the next 20 years as well. Because right now, having grown up here since I was 10, I can tell you nobody's expecting the house on Palisades Crest or the house, the big house to be a home for three or four families. But it's it creates a, a segregation in expectation of where exactly this higher development higher density is going to be and I mean I'm, I'm going to stop short of saying that's not fair but I think it is a short fall in thinking of where the economic driver where's the economic tipping point on some of these because we've established that the middle housing is not necessarily affordable housing so somebody buying a two million dollar three million dollar house in the hills that can subdivide it and get multiple multiple million dollar units don't think it might not happen down the road that's all thanks kate um yeah and you know I, I think that's kind of why we tried to design our partially vacant uh land analysis to account for a bit of that you know again there's um we, we do have a history of you know annexations and the sort of rate that we could we might be able to expect so you know we're not necessarily um you know, trying to predict, a, you know, a real change there, but trying to be realistic and looking at some of these lots and, and looking at how they've developed um, over the last 10, 20 years, we have seen not a, a huge amount of it uh, as, as you're aware, but there are some lots that do make sense um, for development, even with that sort of infrastructure part of the equation. And so that's, you know, something that we again attempted to account for in this analysis. Um, but, you know, in terms of what we want to target um, for a housing production strategy, you know, we certainly can, um, you know, think a little bit more about, you know, the sort of differences between the demographics in those areas and what, um, you know, if we do, and, you know, there's not necessarily a guarantee that we will by any means, but if we do end up sort of focusing on those areas for whatever reason, you know, um, make sure to have a very, you know, fine grained approach. Um, so, you know, I, I would say, you know, there's, there, we've made assumptions, you know, within these documents, but we do have an opportunity with those strategies to, um, you know, work towards outcomes that are more, um, you know, equitable or desirable for, you know, folks, um, you know, on both sides of the uh, urban service boundary, if you will. Yeah, and I'll, I'll note a couple of things um, as I'm looking at this map here that might be missing. So we've, you know, we've identified partially vacant land, but we haven't yet looked at, you um, land that might be redevelopable in mixed use zones and multifamily zones. And that's probably not what you're talking about, but we have um, we have made kind of a numerical assumption of about 400 something units um, of middle housing kind of uh, occurring just as 3% of all of the single family dwellings in the city. And so there, there isn't like a great way to 
represent that visually, but we are assuming some amount of uh, development activity in in a variety of different locations in the city and urban growth boundary and um, you know this the study area. I guess it's kind of a a cold term, but we can say that the study area. Um, so that's that's something that you're not seeing on this map that does imply kind of future development activity. I, I um, would just, uh, oh, go ahead. I was going to say I would just add a couple of things. I think, <clears throat> excuse me, really good points about being clear with the terms we use and and accurate in describing what we mean when we use certain terms. I I would say a couple of things about just kind of the way this methodology is oriented and it's. There's some pretty prescriptive rules that we need to follow in terms of the areas we look at and the, the underlying assumptions we have. So we are required to look at not just the area within the city limits, but within the, the urban growth boundary that's associated with Lake Oswego's planning area. So that's why, you know, you see not just stuff in the city limits, but also within the UGB, but that's adjacent to Lake Oswego. And so we need to look at those areas. And we need to come up with sort of a consistent way to um, define what we assume is called partially vacant and some assumptions about what types of parcels might, again, see more development over a certain period of time. So that's what we're trying to do here. And, and we're, we're trying to sort of show that not so much to say that the city is targeting those areas for development, just to say based on the, an, the analysis and steps we go through, there's the potential for develop in the development in those areas. But I think, you know, your points about kind of how we think about that, how we define those areas, how we talk about them and describe them, I think all really good points. And we can, I think, do some more to kind of articulate some of those issues in the reports and in the analysis. But I do just want to point out that, you know, we are, we are, um, we don't have um, total flexibility in kind of how we do this. We are sort of guided by certain things at the state level and the regional level. So I just kind of want to note those things and also just say, you know, really good comments, um, but try to just explain some of what we're doing and why we're doing it and note that we can do better in terms of how we describe it, so. I mean, in an ideal scenario, a way to approach it, which I don't know that you have time at this point to do the research, but would be to do a sub-segment that says this is the this is the demographic, I mean, the same demographic information in the first half, like here's the subsegment of these lots that fall within our UGB and that data. And then here would be an aggregate total if we were accounting for the whole. I, I mean, I, yeah, I think I, I, I get what you're saying. We could look at something like uh, building improvement value is something we have on a lot by lot basis. Census data is a little bit harder to to get so granular, but um, but I, yeah, we can we can take a look at um, what the differences might be between different neighborhoods, kind of in the city and outside of the city, and uh, roll that into our analysis. Um, let's take a question from Mike. Yeah, hi. Thank you for the presentation tonight. This has been really informative. Um, one thing that seems to be missing is any aspect of equity. I know the whole DEI um, dimension has been very big with the city council over the last few years. And Lake Oswego has historically been a sort of rich enclave with really, really um, prescriptive land use where, you know, you can only build single family homes, and, you know, car, car dependent neighborhoods and that sort of thing. Is there is is there any aspect of equity here to the um, the needs analysis where we say that we want uh, lower income people, you know, people making the median wage, to be able to buy uh, or own a unit within Lake Oswego, um, because that's one one audience we're not hearing from is the people that don't live in Lake Oswego, and who wanted to move here, but couldn't because they just don't make enough money. Um, we did see um, that we have a net influx of commuters. And if we can build more housing that's affordable to those jobs, we could also cut down on that commuting and that traffic. 
um, and and also increase you know property tax uh, income and all that sort of thing, making our city stronger. So, um, what you know, how do, how do you characterize uh, equity in in the terms of this of this um, this study? Um, there, there's a couple of points. I'm going to let Eric talk to kind of the city's um, role in this, but the the next phase of this study um, called the housing production strategy has a lot of requirements as far as public engagement and um, like dis an, an explicit analysis of disparate impacts of land use decisions that are part of it. Um, we're just not there yet. Um, but we're we're sort of at the early point of saying, wow, look, there may you know there may be a discrepancy between the incomes of people who live and work and want housing in Lake Oswego and the the kind of housing that's available. So we're kind of early early stages here, and then we're going to take this body of work to you all to the the task force to the uh, planning commission and city council, and that's where those discussions are going to happen. And then as in later phases, as we talk about strategies to address those things. Um, equity, I'm sure, will be a, a pretty strong concern. So I'll let Eric answer to, to that more specifically. Yeah, and I would say, you know, just kind of echo um, what Andrew had mentioned about this just kind of being point in the process where we're doing a really qualitative, or I'm sorry, quantitative look really um, at the current situation, what we could expect in terms of land development, what we can expect in terms of population forecasting. Um, so that is, you know, a fundamental, um, you know, sort of piece of uh, looking a little bit, um, you know, at those strategies and how we can address some of the um, sort of affordability issues that we're seeing or um, the ability for the existing housing stock to meet those, um, you know, the affordability levels that we think will be needed in the next 20 years. So um, really, this is a bit more of a constrained part of the process, if you will, we are bound a little bit more to um, state sort of process or metro projections at this point, uh, but there is a lot more opportunity to um, look, uh, you know, more holistically at approaches that make sense for Lake Oswego um, through the housing production strategy piece, which we're going to be ramping up on essentially once we um, get this uh, housing needs analysis adopted. Um, so, you know, I, I would just mention a bit about the process that the city has used. You know, we have um, convened a housing production strategy task force that is um, fairly broad in representation in terms of the number of folks that, um, you know, both either um, live in Lake Oswego or work in Lake Oswego, um, produce housing in Lake Oswego. So we really have a good, good um, well-rounded, I guess, group of folks that have experience um, or have experienced difficulty, I guess, in particular, and some challenges accessing housing in Lake Oswego. So we're really trying to target um, folks um, through the task force work and, you know, have um, we actually got a great response for a solicitation that we put out um, in August and September or so of last year for members for the task force. And we were able to uh, to get a good group um, representing, representing, I guess, a lot of folks that have um, experienced that challenge of finding housing in Lake Oswego. Um, so right now, again, we're really talking a little bit about like, based on this research, does this look right to you before we kind of move forward and have a little bit more of the conversation about how do we, um, you know, specifically target the types of housing um, that can serve, uh, you know, folks that we know do not currently have access to the city. Um, so, you know, I, I think that there um, has been a pretty concerted effort from uh, city council as well to kind of really look at ways to promote the development of affordable housing. And, and you know, this is another tool in terms of policies and specific um, agreements or, you um, uh, commitments that the city can make in the future to continue producing affordable housing or specifically target um, certain types of housing, um, you know, whether it be for folks that are aging in place or, you know, folks that want less floor area, for instance, um, or just more affordable sort of forms of housing. So there's a lot of different ways we can do that. But, um, you know, that has been our uh, sort of approach from the get go is that we want to, to put that equity lens um, you know, it, basically within the project as much as we can. Um, so that is something we'll also be using to kind of ground the conversations about that production strategy moving forward. Um, you know, specifically who are we serving with this work and, you know, who has been left out of previous engagement efforts. So 
lots of opportunities to address this. Again, lots of public engagement, um, you know, obviously currently, but to come um, when it comes to those strategies. Um, so again, you know, really, really um, appreciate the comments, um, appreciate any sort of uh, information about ways that we can do that better or improve as we move forward. Um, but that is something that we are really hoping to, um, you know, dive into head first with the housing production strategy work. And I encourage you to go to the online open house and uh, say, uh, put in some comments to that effect, because um, those things get read and um, we have a lot of uh, more general questions there about kind of what what do you see as the, the main housing needs um, of the, the the city and, and surrounding areas. So um, that will, uh, anyway, um, yeah, please, please, please go there and, and provide your comments. Um, yep, yeah, and Carolyn, question from you. Yes, um, I just want to hone in a little bit more on middle housing, because I think this is something that's been on, at least on my radar, I know it's been on a lot of people's radar. It's very new. It's very um, challenging to think about. And I think the the project that you're working on needs more information on this. Um, for example, I know I know that there are areas of the city that do not have a, um, middle housing potential for them because they are in homeowners associations. I've got one just behind me is a homeowners association that is not subject to middle housing. And I think that the map could, or you could have a map that helps us to understand where those areas are because there's going to not be middle housing there more than likely. And we need more information, I think, to give that geographic sense of where middle housing could go versus where it won't go. Um, that's one thing. And I think that my point here about that I put in the, the chat about the 410 units that are listed that you showed as the 3%. Um, I'd like to understand how and if there are ways that we can incentivize ownership, bring that um, the develop that um, building wealth opportunity, which I think is absolutely an equity issue. Um, we when we have barriers to home ownership, I think it does create barriers to equity. And I'd like to have that as part of the conversation. I don't know how, how and when, where that comes in, but I did want to bring that up tonight. Yeah, just on your on your second point, um, home ownership opportunities as part of middle housing is definitely something that we've seen across the state. Um, land trust models are pretty common um, in in that they. Um, there's a nonprofit associated that kind of owns the land and keeps the housing unit affordable, but um, the 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 people who buy in can still accumulate kind of um, equity in in that unit. And as it, when they're ready to sell it, um, it it remains kind of affordable at that level, but they get to keep a certain amount of equity in it. So there are models that we've seen that are are um, that seem to be effective. Active. It entails the city partnering with somebody um, like a nonprofit to to kind of do that work and um, and and make that happen. But that's certainly a component of um, middle housing that we can look at, and that the it's going to be a strategy and a long list of strategies that we um, provide to the the city to consider going forward. Um, as to um, the question of uh, CCNRs, um, conditions, covenants, and restrictions, I, I think is what that stands for. Um, I'll, I'll leave that to, I think, Eric to um, tell us about. Yeah, so that's something, you know, I think, Carolyn, you um, accurately pointed out, you know, there's, um, you know, much more limited potential for the development of mental housing in areas that are covered by um, CCNRs, or often those are associated with the Homeowners Association. Um, you know, of course, the city when we adopted our mental housing regulations had to plan for the potential that those could be sort of changed in such a way that could allow for middle housing. So we had to make it such that the zoning wasn't the barrier. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's likely there and it's, you know, you know that that would be changed. Um, so, you know, the city is at least 
fulfilled our part of the requirement, um, but we did not um, get that information as a part of the middle housing work. And that's something that we have heard some feedback um, about this in, in the past and, and um, some of our task force discussions. So that is, um, you know, again, a, a really a comment that we appreciate. And I think that would add a lot of detail to our work. Um, it is a large undertaking. So we'll have to figure out, you know, as a city, how we can fund that. And, um, you know, there's a lot of these private agreements, which aren't necessarily, um, you know, uh, don't, don't necessarily involve the city as a party that we'd have to kind of dig through. Um, other cities, you know, that are a bit larger have had the um, capacity to take that on. So um, it is something that if we, you know, decide to really, um, if, if we hear more comments or like this, or, you know, we um, decide, um, you know, collectively to move forward and really dig into middle housing in particular and, and strategies to promote that, um, which is, is certainly not unlikely, um, it will certainly make sense to do that more fine grain analysis and think more about where we could expect that to occur based on these CCNRs, or, you know, in addition to the other uh, constraints and, and uh, different uh, sort of land factors that we're considering with this analysis. So um, anyway, um, you know, I think we do, you know, as a city uh, really want to plan for what's real, what's realistic, but we also, um, you know, know that things change. So we at least have zoning to um, not serve as a barrier to middle housing in those areas. Um, but that's a really good comment. It's been, you know, something that we've heard consistently throughout the course of our middle housing work that, um, you know, that, you know, the folks are, um, you know, sort of concerned about the elements of the bill that weren't able to affect um, existing CCNRs that prohibit middle housing um, that weren't sort of retroactively um, changed through this legislation. So, um, you know, this is uh, something that's been on our radar for a while, and I think it might be making sense for the city to uh, dig a little bit further into that uh, through that, again, the strategy work. Thank you. Really good okay. comments. Really appreciate it. Um, and I uh, just want to make another plug for folks to um, go to that online open house. I added another link to it in the chat. Um, so just a reminder that, um, you know, we really look forward to uh, seeing a little bit more uh, fine grained information and uh, input from you all in, in that survey. And please uh, share it with your networks and distribute it um, as widely as you can within the folks that you know here in Lake Oswego. So um, I just wanted to sort of leave everyone here with uh, next steps for this project. Um, it will be um, considered at a public hearing in the summer at the Planning Commission and City Council, but in the next month, there's a lot going on. Of course, uh, tonight we um, held this community forum, but moving forward um, for uh, the rest of the month up until at least April 21st, not the entirety of the month, but up until April 21st, we will have an online open house that we've been trying to get folks to, to go um, fill out and um, provide their input at. So that's a really good way to provide input um, that will be available again through the 21st. Um, there's also a planning commission work session coming up next Monday at 6.30 p.m. where we'll be going over similar information, getting input from the planning commission, and then going over similar information with city council um, later in the month on the 18th of April on um, that Tuesday at 3 p.m. So those are just, that's kind of just a taste of what we're doing this month. Um, you know, we, we will be meeting the Housing Production Strategy Task Force in the coming months as well. And again, going to public hearing with um, revisions to these documents really um, that will reflect the input and sort of uh, feedback that we're getting at these various junctures on the work that we put out, um, as well as kind of um, a new kind of reconciliation of these two elements and a, a larger kind of final housing needs analysis report. So we've been looking at the buildable lands inventory and housing capacity analysis, but um, we'll have a little bit more of a synthesis of that information that we'll be able to provide with that final HNA report. Um, Andy, I don't know, or Andrew, I don't know if you want to add to, uh, anything to that. Um, no, no, nothing else to add. Thank you so much for the really good conversation um, this evening. Uh, really nice to See a, see a group of folks who uh, care about their community and have a, a, I don't know, detailed insight into what's going on. So um, really appreciate all your feedback. Um, give it to us in writing once more time, one more time um, on the uh, online open house, and we'll be sure to get it. Um, and uh, 
again, um, reach out to Eric if you have any further questions, if there's anything that you you realized you really just wanted to say but but forgot to at this meeting. Um, get get in touch with Eric. He'll get he'll get in touch with us and uh, we'll roll it into our reports. So thanks again, everybody. And really quickly, let me put my information in the chat uh, now that you mentioned that. So. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night.